here today and uh, we just hope that you are enjoying this cold weather I know I'm not <laughs> but uh, even if it's cold it's warm in here and we're glad to have you here both in person and online so if you're online be sure to say a quick hello and uh, we're gonna sing a couple more songs together
Well, good morning. I'm so glad you're here, whether you're in person with us or you're online. It is great to have you here. As you saw, we are going into a new series in two weeks, and we all could use a little bit more positivity right now. So I hope it will encourage you as a, as a series. I hope you'll commit to that time block. It's a six-week series, and put that in your calendar. Say, hey, I'm going to make these six weeks, whether it's online or in person. Invite your friends out to that. If you're online with us, you have a quick and easy way to invite friends in. And if you just click on the invite tab, you can, or, or the thing that just posted in there, you can easily just send that out and you can, you can put it on social media, you can message your friends, you can email your friends, and it'll actually give them a link to where you are right now online. How cool is that? You can say hi to each other, and I hope you're doing that online. If you're here in person, it's so cool to have you in person. It's great to have as many people as we can here. It really is. And I know it's nice to stay home where it's warm and it's comfortable and all that, and that's great. But it's so neat to be able to see each other in person and to interact. And so if you're in the area, we invite you to come down on a Sunday morning and be here with us in person. If you're a guest with us, we are so glad you're here, whether it's online again or in person. And we have a gift for you. It's a book by Andy Stanley called How Good Is Good Enough. And love for you to have this. So in person, you can just grab it in the back. If you're online, just let us know and we will, we will mail that out to you. Maybe you've read it already and you're like, man, I wish I get this in the hands of one of my friends because they just really need to hear this. And maybe this is an easy way to, to do that. Let us know. We'll send you the book and get it into their hands. If you're online, there's a few tabs that make some things easier. You can do the connection card, and we ask every week, if you're online with us, just fill it out. Just say, hey, I was here. And if you got a prayer request, you can put that in, in there. If you're in person, the connection cards are in the back. And you could grab one and put that in the box back there as well. If you are are giving towards this ministry, there's a few ways to give. One is the text to give, that's a great tool. There's secure give online, it's easy with the tab. In person, there's an envelope, or you can log in on your phone. Actually, you can even say hi to everybody else online if you'd like to. This past week, we got to do something really cool, and that was we, we had our Super Tuesday, and we used to do a Super Sunday this year. We just said, hey, let's do a Tuesday because actually it was our 13-year anniversary as a church. We're 13 years old, and that's pretty cool. And it was a little low-key, but we got to come out. We got to share some soups together because I think we had 13 crockpots of soup, which is amazing. I, don't, I didn't get to try all of them, but I tried very hard. But it was a great night just to hang out, to chat a little bit, and, and to reminisce a little bit about some of the things that have taken place over the past 13 years. As you move to 15, we'll try to do something a lot bigger and broader and all that kind of stuff. But we are so glad you're here with us. What a, what a neat day. What a great time to just, just be together as a church family and, and just invite God in to do something amazing. So why don't we do that? Father, you are awesome. You are a great God. And we are so privileged that you invite us to know you as God that you want to be a part of our lives. You want us to not be afraid to journey with you. So Lord, I, I first just want to pray for those who are, are maybe newer in their faith or, or they're, they're here or listening in out of curiosity, that you would help them to not be afraid to ask the tough questions. To not be afraid just to let go and, and let, let their spiritual journey take place and invite you into that process. Help them as they, as, they, as they read your word, as they experience things, that you will guide them in, in an amazing way. Lord, for those of us who may have been journeying for a long time um, in our spiritual journey, may today you really speak to our hearts too. May May we not take for granted where we are, what we know about you, or, or the, the road we've taken so far. May you continually challenge us in our faith to grow, to step beyond where we are, and to see where you want to take us, not only for tomorrow, but, but the days ahead, and what you want to do with our life, that we may serve and honor you to the best of our ability. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and, and we give this time to you. In his name, amen.
It's Super Bowl Sunday. The Bengals versus the Rams. And both teams have defied odds to get to this place. And this is the first time ever they're going to be facing each other. Now, if you're a Bengals fan, the last time you were in the Super Bowl was 1988, and uh, you guys lost. So if you want to root for the underdog, that's the team to root for. If you like the fancier uniform of the Rams, then go that way, you know. Who are you rooting for? Maybe some of you are like, I don't even watch football or anything. And that, that's fine. I, you know, I per personally like the commercials, but I'm looking forward to, to, to watching the game. You know the thing about sports, though, that, that gets me, and again, I'm not, a, I'm not a really big sports fan. I love playing sports, but I'm, I'm not a big fan of watching all the time. But when it comes to sports, you have certain people, okay, we'll just use that term, certain people who they, they get really excited. Like, they're just, and, and it's part of their personality, and we're all different, okay? So this isn't wrong or right, it's just, that's part of their personality. And, and they're rowdy, and they're shouting, and they're screaming, and, you know, they might wear all their, you know, all their team's garb, you know, they might paint their face or, you know, wear the hats or whatever like that. And they're just all into it, right? And they're shouting out and they're doing that. And that, and that could be in their home, they're doing that, right? And then you have others who are, who are just part of their personality where they're, they're more quiet and reserved and, 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 they, and they just sort of watch. Well, that's what you would expect, that they would just sit back and watch and it's okay. And, 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 and yet, some, not all, when it comes to a game, or this is their team, all of a sudden, it's like, wow, like, oh my. And, and you know, and if you're, if you're dating this person, like this is like a dating relationship, and this is your first time experiencing them at a football game, you're like, who is this person? I don't understand, I don't recognize this person, right? How about you? What, maybe it's not football, maybe it's not even sports, but what gets you fired up? What, what, as I professor used to say, what turns your crank? What, what just like, wow, just revs you up? You know, maybe it's, maybe it's the game. Maybe tonight you're just like the biggest thing. You're just so excited. Maybe it's when you play sports. Like you don't get too excited to watch again. But when you're playing sports, you're like, oh, you're another person. And you're rooting for your team and you're shouting and you're excited and you're off the bench because you just want to yell and, and scream and all that kind of stuff. Maybe it's your kids' games or you got nieces and nephews at play or... You know, or maybe grandkids at this point, and, and they're, you know, they're doing their thing, and, and you go there, and you not only sit in the bleachers, but like you stand up. Like the person behind you is upset because you're just standing up all the time, and you're shouting, and you're screaming, and you're telling them to run, and you're telling them to go, and you get a little upset when the coach, you know, the coach tells them, oh, don't go, play it safe. You're like, no, you could have made it, and, you know, and then if the, the ref makes a bad call, man, you're like, I mean, you're like in his face, you know? And because and, you're excited, right? And the poor kids, you know, they're only five years old and the ref's like 12, but, but you don't care because you're excited about this, right? Maybe it's sports or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a new project. Maybe your boss came to you this week and said, hey, we got a new project coming down the pike and I want you to lead it out. And you're like, yes, this is going to be so cool. And you get to build your team and, and you're just excited. This is, this is, it's, Wow, you know, maybe it's a home project. We just started remodeling our bathroom. Well, actually, we started a few months ago, but maybe you're excited about something like that. It's like, wow, I can't wait to get this done, or, or maybe a business venture. Somebody came to you and said, hey, I, I, I'm thinking of starting this, or, or I'd like to help you get started in this, and you're like, wow. And all of a sudden, it just clicks, and you're like, man, yes, we're going to do this. This is going to be exciting, right? Maybe it's a hobby, or... Or maybe it's sports, and you just, you just love, you just love it. Maybe what gets you excited is, uh, is when you're driving, and it's the open road, and you're just like, yes, this is awesome. Especially if you have a stick, you know. Or maybe what gets you fired up is, is when you're driving on that open road, and then you get to a place where, you know, it's a four-lane highway, and you're driving in the fast lane because... Not because you're going fast, just because people are, you know, they're just not driving as fast. And, and you're just going by, and all of a sudden you see up ahead there's that truck or that car that's going a little slower, and there's somebody behind them. And then all of a sudden, that person decides to get into your lane, and you're like, what are they doing? And they're going uphill, and then they go no faster than the person in the lane that they're trying to pass. And you're like, what are you doing, right? 
See, I can get fired up about that stuff. What gets you fired up? There, there are times when Jesus got fired up. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at one of those as we continue our series, Drive. And if you're new to this series, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the things that drive Jesus. And you can always catch up online. They're all there. And what we've been hoping is literally as we see what drives Jesus, that as we want to follow him, that hopefully, with God's grace, we can, we can take some of the things that drive us that may not be so good and, and adopt the things that drive Jesus. Today we're going to look at is an account that is recorded in a couple different places, but Matthew records it, and Matthew jumps right in, and this is what he does, because we're going to jump right in. It says, Jesus entered the temple. He entered the temple courts, and he drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those who were selling doves. And if you're reading this for the very first time, or if you haven't read it in a while, all of a sudden you're like, wow. You're taken back. And Matthew, I mean, Matthew's just jumping right into the story. So we're like, where did this come from? I mean, Jesus isn't even inside the temple yet. This is the outer court. This is like, if I could describe it in a church setting, like, you know, here we have, you know, pretty much our worship area, and then we have like a walkway out there, but there's not a barrier or foyer. But if you've been to some of the larger churches, and we, we've been to, you know, we've been to a bunch of them, and, and the larger churches, they have the auditorium, and outside the auditorium, they have a large foyer, and some of them are really big. And you can mingle and you can hang out and you can have cups of coffee and, and they have a cafe. I've been to churches where they have a food court and literally they have a food court. They, they put a food court in there so that those who come to serve in a ministry could easily just grab food and low cost. And actually those who were serving in the food court were actually, that was their ministry. And they do this all so that they can help people serve better. And it's just amazing to see all this stuff. That's like the outer court. That's what's going on. And this is why when some come to this passage, they're like, well, that's why we shouldn't have any of that stuff. You know, no bookstore, no nothing, because you can't mix it in with the, with the temple. And, and, it, and if that's where you are, it's just, this isn't what that is all about at all. Why does Jesus seem to blow a gasket? What, what happened? Did he lose patience? Did his emotions get the best of him? Or is there a deeper drive, something inside of him that brought him to this point? Now Matthew goes on and he shares, and he says this, and these are Jesus' words. He says, it is written, Jesus is speaking, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Interesting what he's including in his house, isn't he? It's not just the inner sanctuary, the inner part of the temple, that was the place where the high priest could only go into, where the sacrifices were performed. And then outside of that, you had the rest of the temple area, which is where the Jews would go. And there's different rooms. It's very different than our open auditorium space kind of idea. And then outside of the main temple, so the inner, inner temple, the, the outer rooms and stuff like that, you had what was called the court of the Gentiles. This, this is the outer courts. This is where Jesus is with his disciples. This is where everything is going on. And here that thing is that stealing thing again. If you, if you, as you're reading through the Gospels, and I don't know how often you read through the Gospels, but we come back to this thing again and again and again, the stealing thing. And here he's not only talking about those who would steal, but he refers to this place as the the place that they would hang out. This is the den of the robbers. This is the place where you would, after you steal, you would hang out and brag about your, what you just did. Jesus keeps coming back to this again and again, this whole idea of being stolen from or stealing. Our car was stolen once. I'm glad I only ever experienced that once. We were, we were newly married. I think Julie and I were only you know, two or three years into our marriage. And we had gone out to a, a small group event. 
And we were at the small group house having dinner and stuff like that. And we had parked on a side street because there was like a, a main, main street, you know, that we walked down. That's where the house was. And so we decided to park on one of the side streets and walk down. And so we did. After the event, we, we came out and we went down a couple streets because we were pretty sure that, yeah, this is the street where we parked. And we walked down the street and we're like, well, maybe we didn't park on this street. And so we go down to the next one and we walk down that street. And we're like, and, it, and there were short blocks. So it was like, you know, you just thought, well, maybe we missed it. So we walked down the next street and we're like, no. And we might have even gone to the next one and, and no. And then we went all the way back to the first one because we were positive we didn't park on that street. But our car has to be somewhere. We remembered where we parked, like on it, because all the streets look identical. And, and it's nowhere. And it was, it was gone. It was literally gone. Somebody had taken our car. And we felt violated. You felt cheated. You felt uneasy. And, and, and even going home that night, you know, friends gave us a ride, and we got home. And th- we had put our our registration and our insurance card in a glove compartment. I mean, that's what you do, right? And, and our home address is on that. And we're thinking, they have our home address too. Now, I don't know why they would come to our house, but, but it just really made you feel uneasy. This is what Jesus is feeling. He feels violated. He feels like he's been robbed from. And so Jesus is, is, is ticked. So did he lose his cool? Did he, did he sin? Or is there a drive that was compelling him that goes much deeper? One of the things that could confuse, confuse us is our emotions. They do that. You know, when emotion is triggered, our entire nervous system kicks into gear. And we don't even realize, but that's what's happening. And it creates these feelings. And that's a good thing because God created feelings and, and they're, they're wonderful when they're in the right and proper place, right? Right. But we have to process those feelings. We have, to, we have to understand where they're coming from so we can act appropriately. Now at times, when, when something happens, we need to act quickly because maybe there's danger. And so automatically, you know, and God built that into us, that, that we can respond in an instant because of danger. But often what happens is we, we act out of an emotional response. And sometimes it's not, and you know this because we all do this, right? It's not from what was happening there at that moment, but it's something that happened maybe earlier. Like something bad happens at work, and then guess what? You bring it home. And then, and then the smallest thing just sort of like aggravates you, right? Well, that's not what's aggravating you. It's, it's what happened here. Or maybe the reverse, you know, something happens in the morning at home, and then you go to work and you bring that. Or maybe it happened earlier in the week or, or maybe even years ago. And, and when we're faced with, with an emotion, it triggers all of that. And sometimes we don't even realize it. And all those things just come flooding in. And when we confuse our emotions with our drive, it'll mess us up. Because sometimes what happens is we act too quickly. Sometimes we're too slow and we don't act at all. But we think that we are being driven by something greater. And so, so we react and we're like, man, this is, this, I have a right reason to feel this way and I'm justified in this. And all it is, is emotions. It's not a drive. One of the things I, I love about the Gospels, and I, and I hope you read the Gospels, but there's four of them. That's so cool. So we have four different perspectives on the life of Jesus. And God designed it that way. He wanted us to have four different perspectives. And and the interesting thing about that is every single one of the authors is is a different personality. So they write differently. They also write to a different audience. Every one of the Gospels is written to a different audience. So what they want to communicate is very different than the other one. They also are communicating a different aspect of Jesus. For example, Matthew continually talks about Jesus as the king writing to the Jewish people. That's huge. So when you're reading through, you're going to see the kingship of Jesus Christ a lot more. Mark is talking about Jesus as the servant who came. And so that's his perspective. And as you put those together, we get a better, bigger picture of who Jesus is because we're seeing different aspects of him. The amazing thing is they don't contradict each other. And that should blow us away in and of itself. But sometimes you have to look through the, the... the little nuances to say, okay, this is their perspective and this is the story they're telling. 
which is all true, but Mark, man, he just adds a little stuff in there, or John adds a little stuff in there. What I want to do is look at the same account in John, because John gives us a little bit more light into the situation. And John starts out like this. He says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, it's not that you don't know that's happening if you're reading Matthew, but Matthew doesn't lead in with that. He just jumps right in. It's like, okay, jump right in. Let's go. Let's talk about this, you know. Where John gives you a little bit more backstory. He gives you a time frame. He, he's telling you what's on the heart and mind of the Jewish people and what's on the heart and mind of Jesus. This is a big deal. I mean, Passover is like, I mean, this is bigger than Christmas, okay? And even if you're a Christmas fanatic, this is huge. It was a reminder to the Jewish people of the sacrificial lamb. When, when they were in Egypt, in slavery, you know, Moses comes along and, and, and God tells them through Moses, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to go out to your field and I want you to pick the best lamb you got. You know, and if your neighbors don't have a lamb, you invite them into your house and you bring this lamb in and I want you to kill it. And that lamb is a sacrifice. And I want, to take you, I want you to take the blood and you're going to take that blood of the lamb and you're going to put it over your doorpost. And that doorpost, as, a, as the angel of death comes through and sees that blood, it will pass over you. That's why it's called the Passover. And because they did that, they are led out of Egypt. And they are brought into freedom from all the 400 years of bondage that they were in. And it's all because of God's grace and because now God was acting in a way that, that was, their, was their victor, was their, was their champion, and they now experience freedom. All that's wrapped up in the Passover. And all that is now wrapped up in what happens and what takes place in the temple. This is what's on the mind and the heart of Jesus and should be on the crowds. John goes on, and it's similar to Matthew. Listen to what he says. He says, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. And at first glance, you know, if you walk into there, you're like, okay, this is what happens. I mean, this is just normal, everyday stuff in, in, in Judaism because, you know, it's time for Passover and people have to come and they have to bring their sacrifices. And, and, and guess what? They might not have an animal. So guess what? That the temple set it up so guess what you could come and you could buy your animal and you could go in and sacrifice right or give it to the priest but you could go do that and if you don't have the right currency what happens is we're going to exchange that for you because you have to use temple currency and you have to bring that in and then you can use that and you can buy whatever you need and they they were allowing this to all take place so it looks good but this is not what god had in mind it was, it was filled with corruption, but they were so used to it. This is just the way it is that they didn't even see it anymore. And they're exchanging currency. And when they exchange a currency, guess what? There's a markup on that currency. And then they're selling animals, and guess what? It's like getting food at a stadium. The prices are way jacked up. Why? Because you got to get your animal. And if you brought an animal from home, it probably wasn't good enough, so you got to buy one of theirs. And literally what had happened was that the Jewish leaders had created a system and they had put in place laws that the people had to follow and it benefited them financially. That's just wrong, right? And this is what Jesus is seeing taking place. One day I was taking a drive. I love to drive. And I, I was taking a drive. I don't remember where I was going. I just remember what happened. And I was out on a drive, and it was, I think it was like springtime. So it was past, you know, where you needed heat in the car. And it was just before you needed air conditioning and stuff like that. You know, I might even have the, you know, the sunroof open or something like that. And, and I'm driving down the road. And, and as I'm driving for a while, I, I just started feeling a little off. And I'm, I'm like... I, mean, I felt okay this morning. I don't know why I feel like it was one of those things where you feel like something's coming on and, and you're, you're a little like, okay, maybe I should worry. Maybe I should just, you know, get some more, you know, I don't know, eat something or whatever, try to kick it out. And, and, and it was one of those things. And as I kept driving, I kept feeling a little bit worse. And I'm like, man, am I like coming down with a fever? 
you know, and, and I'm driving. And then, and then I started feeling like a little bit more hot. And, and then I was like, man, I'm, I'm sweating. And I'm like, oh man, I must be really like, like I didn't feel sick yet, but something must be really coming on. And so I go to reach for the air conditioner to pop the air conditioner on, which I really shouldn't have needed yet. And I noticed that my seat, the heated seat was on low. And I'm like, oh, well that makes so much more sense, right? But I didn't realize it. Emotions can do that. They, they sometimes could come on so slowly that we don't realize how they're impacting us. And then we start thinking all kinds of things. Confusing our emotions is one thing, but when we let our emotions drive us, it may wreck us. We do things that we're not supposed to do, we shouldn't do. And we don't do the things that we should do. We become afraid, and so we don't act. We don't try. And somebody comes along and says, oh, you should try this. Nah, I'm not. I'm good, right? Because of fear. We don't act. Or we don't confront something that needs to be confronted. Or, or don't look at something a little bit more serious in our life because, because we're afraid to even go there. When we're sad, you know, somebody says something, somebody does something, and, and, and we just feel like, oh my goodness, why did they hurt me, you know? And maybe they didn't even know they hurt us, but, but we feel it. And we feel sad, and guess what? If you're that type of personality, you're going to regress, aren't you? Because that bothers you. And so you regress, and you pull into your little shell, because and, and, that's where you're comfortable. And so you pull back. And then, and then we pull back in such a way, because we get really good at this stuff. We pull back in such a way that those around us that are closest to us that could kick us out of this, we, we do it in such a way that, that it's subtle so that, because we know where they are and how they're going to respond to us. So we do it in a subtle way so that we can, we can stay in our little shell and we're protective. And why do we do this? All because of emotions. And anger? Oh my goodness. Anger, I mean, it has its place, but anger, wow. All kinds of things can go wrong with anger. Jesus didn't snap. He didn't lose his cool. He's watching. And he's watching. And this is what John records. So he said, so he made a whip out of cords. This is very different to Matthew's account, isn't it, right? And so Jesus makes a whip. Now, how did he do this? I don't know. I don't know how long this took. We don't know because we don't get all those details. We, we get a story and we, we miss all that fun, like the more details. Um, so, so what took place? I mean, they could have walked into the market and Jesus met up with John and Peter and they're like, hey man, you know, how's it going? This is normal. They were so used to it. Jesus had experienced this before. It's nothing new. But he walks in here. Maybe he went up to one of the first merchants and said, hey, could I get a couple of those cords? I'm like, oh yeah, sure. And he takes out his money, pays him. And, you know, and maybe they're walking around and Jesus is here like weaving this thing together, right? <laughs> And, and the disciples are like, what are you doing? Just, ah, don't worry about it, you know. And they're walking around. And, and maybe they walked around for hours. Who knows? And as they're walking around, Jesus is interacting. And again, we're just speculating. We don't know because we weren't there. But he made the whip. This takes time. And as he's doing it, he's watching and he's seeing what they're doing. And they're stealing. They're stealing. They're stealing. The Jewish leaders had put in place stuff so that they could steal from their own Jewish people. And then the Jewish people were merchants that were piking things up when they didn't need to. And they were stealing from Jewish people. And then you had the outsiders that were coming in and traveled a far distance. And guess what? They're stealing from them too. And he's watching all of this. And they're not only stealing from each other, they're stealing from God. Because they're missing the entire purpose of why this is all put in place. And so Jesus made a whip. And he drove out all the temple courts... All of them, okay? All of them from the temple courts, both the sheep and the cattle. Okay, so it gets a little bit more elaborate than Matthew, right? And he scatters the coins of the money changers and overturns their tables. Whoa. This is not an act of anger. This was something more. This was something deeper inside of Jesus. This isn't why he walked in and blew a fuse. He, he channeled his anger and he acted in this way because of what drove him. Now John goes on to record. To those who sold doves, he says, to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. 
Last week, we, we looked at the, one of the drives of Jesus. And the passage we were looking at, Jesus told us to keep watch. He's with his disciples, and it's coming down to the, to the end of his, his earthly life. And so he's given them some things that are going to happen before he will return. Because he says, hey, I'm going to go away. I'm going to go you know, to heaven, but I'm coming back. And before I come back, there's these things that are going to take place, and I want you to look for them. I want you to watch for them. And then he gave a little parable. And we talked about this last week. He said, you know, if the owner of the house had known when they were going to get broken into, what would they do? They would stop the thief from coming in, right? Well, who does this temple belong to? It belongs to God. This temple was created for God. And God is there in their midst. And the thieves have come in to steal, not just the money. This is not just about money. They have stolen the purpose of the temple. And what do you do? What did Jesus just just tell them? He he said, you protect it, don't you? Jesus is protecting his house. And then John leaves us with something. And he tells us what was driving Jesus. And he says it in a passive way. He says, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. This is actually a a psalm of David that John is now bringing into play. That the same heart and passion of David is the heart and passion that's on Jesus. And it's prophetic in nature. For David, when he wrote this, they didn't have the temple. Well, not like this. The temple in David's day was a tent. And and God said, look, you create this tent and I'll meet you in there. And and we know God can't exist in a tent. He's bigger than that. But, But he was teaching his people. And so David, that was his concept of the temple. That was his concept of, of God's house. It was Solomon who built the, the, the physical structure more. For most of us, the image we have of Jesus is a, a very gentle, loving, a, a friendly and kind person. And when you see an action like this, it's it's a completely different side of Jesus. And and we ask ourselves, who is this? Who is this? I I, I don't understand. The word zeal means this. Great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of cause or an object or an objective. Negatively, you could describe a zeal as a, a jealous husband acting out. Okay, and if you've ever heard stories or experienced that, that that, that could get really, really, let's just say big, okay? It's just a a mess, okay? That's the negative side and and how bad that could go, okay? On the positive side, it's an extraordinary concern. It's an act of enthusiasm. The word zeal, if if you use the New Living Translation, that's why different translations are helpful too. It says this, passion for God's house will consume me. Passion is much deeper than emotions. And if you know someone who has it, you can't miss it. Because it's not emotional based. Emotions can get expressed through that, but passion drives you when no one else cares. Passion is what what wakes you up because I got to do this. Passion is what keeps you up late at night because you got to do this. And yeah, you're tired, but you just keep going. Why? Because of passion. Passion. You press on no matter what. No matter what people say, no matter what they do, no matter how much they discourage you, it doesn't matter. You will not let go of this. You will not give up. Why? That's passion. What drove Jesus was not anger. Jesus was driven by passion. Passion is, I will even when. I will even when. When I don't feel like it. Because it's not based on emotions or feelings. So maybe for you, you know, you're passionate about your health. And you're like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm trying to eat better. And the people around you may not care. And they're eating whatever. And you're like, does it matter? You're not going to be tempted. Why? Because you're, you're, you're passionate about this. And you're going to eat better. Maybe for you, it's exercising. And so you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and you go to the gym. And so it's like, man, you're just crazy. That doesn't phase you. Why? Because you're passionate about this. You want to get in shape. You want to stay in shape. You work hard. Why do you work hard? Because you're passionate about what you do. 
Maybe you get up in the morning or maybe it's late at night and you read the scriptures. Why? Because it's a passion, not because you feel like it or you didn't feel like it. You spend time in prayer. Why? Because you feel like it? No, because you're just passionate about it. You know God wants a relationship and wants to hear what you have to say. You serve him out of passion, not out of emotions or feelings. When you have passion for something, it's, it's translated into that. Your job. You are, you know, God gave you gifts and he gave you talents and you have a job for, for whatever that is, right? And you're, you, you should be passionate about it. Why? Because you're using your gifts and your talents and your abilities and you're doing something with that. You can be passionate about a job. You can be passionate about a hobby. You could be passionate about your car, man. You're waxing and washing all the time because you're passionate about it. I'm passionate about my wife, so you can't be because that's my wife, okay? You could be passionate about a lot of things, but emotions, emotions mess with us because we're not sure. Because we base it on feeling. John wrote, he said, God so loved the world. God loves us. He loves you. That's why he came. He, he went to the cross because he loves you, right? He loves you. And you, say, and, and you may be saying, well, I, I, you know, I don't know if I really feel like God loves me. But he said he does. Yeah, but I don't know. There's times where I just don't feel like things are going right in my life, you know. And we could do this for other people too. We could do it for our spouse. We could do it for our kids. We could do it for our parents. You know, it's like I don't, I don't really feel it. Okay, I, I get that. But God loves you. And if we get lost in the emotions, we can go down that path forever. But see, passion, passion creates action. Are we confusing our emotions with a drive? The temple for Jesus was a physical place, and he acted on that out of zeal, out of passion. Now that we're on the other side of the Old Testament, okay, and, and that's a whole other discussion, but we are, in, we are in that era where we're after the cross, we're after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're after the time when the Holy Spirit comes upon those who believe and are followers of Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it's different than what God did through the Old Testament. Paul describes it like this. He says, you know, we don't have a physical temple. We don't need that physical temple anymore. I mean, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and, and we don't need it. Why? Because Christ came and he was our sacrifice and we don't need any more sacrifices. And, and someday the Jewish people will rebuild it because we know that's going to happen. But, but not as believers. We don't need that. And Paul describes the temple now is, guess what? Is you. You. You are the temple of God. God literally chooses to reside inside of you the moment you believed in Jesus Christ. Are you passionate about the temple? Doesn't that change everything? I mean, if Jesus was so passionate about the temple, he didn't want anybody stealing from him. He didn't want anybody stealing from their idea of God or, or what worship was about. And he, he acted on that, didn't he? If we put that into our lives, what happens? Will we let someone, the, somebody steal our health? No, would we? Would we let somebody steal an emotion, making us feel sad or, or depressed or anything like that? No, why would we do that? That's part of our body. That's part of our physical makeup. Our bodies are the temple of God. That should drive us like it drove Jesus to be passionate about what we do with our bodies, shouldn't it? Now, Paul didn't just stop with the body of an individual. Paul takes a little further. And the other illustration he uses for the temple is not the singular body, but the body of Christ, the church. And he says, don't let anybody steal. Don't let anybody mess with the body. Don't you mess with the body. 
The body is so critical that the church is so critical because not only does, does God reside individually inside of each of us, but collectively it is that much more powerful. Don't mess with the body of Christ, the church. Be passionate about the body of Christ, the church. The drive of passion creates action. It causes action. You can't be passionate about something and not act on it. For God so loved the world. And I get it. We struggle. Does God really love me? Of course he did. Why? Because he's passionate. Passion drives him. So he gave his only son. There's no more guessing. His passion drove him to action. Does your passion, does passion drive you? Is my passion for God creating action? And that's the question that I think Jesus is challenging us with this. Father, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the cross. Thank you that you loved us so much that you acted on that and you sent your son to die for us. No greater love can anybody give than to give up their own life. So Lord, I, I'm asking that as, as we all got our passions and we all got our drives that we have to deal with and, and Lord, hopefully some of the stuff you challenged us on today will, will hopefully help us to reflect. But most of all, Lord, what I, what I want us to walk away with today is that your passion drove you to act and it continually drives you to act. So will you help us in our doubts, in our faith walk? For some, it's even, even trying to figure out if you're really real. Is eternity real? For others of us, we're, we, we're struggling through life and we're wondering, God, are, are you really involved in my life? Do you really care? So Lord, may our emotions not drive us, but may our passion drive us. May you instill us the passion that you have. And as we read your word, as we continue to dive into it, may we see more and more how your passion drove you to act for us all the time. Thank you, God, for the challenges today in our minds and in our hearts. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you.